Good morning. Today we're continuing our series on Acts. Last week Phil looked at the beginning of Acts 2 and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the impact it had on the disciples. And we reflected a bit on the need for us to be spirit-filled as individuals and the impact this can have on our lives. This week we continue to think about the effects of Pentecost on the early believers and we're going to be focusing on what a church made up of truly spirit-filled individuals might look like based on the wonderful description Luke gives us in these verses we're looking at today. The disciples had received the Holy Spirit and this transformed their lives and made the early church what it was. The question is, can the same be said for us, for our lives and for the life of our church? A.W. Tozer, an American pastor and theologian, once said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. The New Testament church may not have come into existence at all if the disciples had not waited for the Holy Spirit as Jesus had instructed them to do and if they'd not been willing to receive it and then go out and live and act in the power of the Spirit. Because before Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were fearful and afraid, despite the fact that some of them had seen the risen Jesus multiple times. There's no mention of them going out sharing their faith. Yet immediately after the Holy Spirit came, they were emboldened to address the crowd, to share the good news of Jesus with them. And an amazing 3,000 people were baptised and added to their number that day. Peter and the other disciples were empowered by the Holy Spirit to witness to others about their faith. And as a result, the church grew. How much of what we do is reliant on the Holy Spirit? And how much do we just do in our own strength? What difference does the Spirit make to our lives and the life of our church here in Skipton? Before reflecting any further, I'd like to share a short story with you by the theologian Soren Kierkegaard about Duckland. You may have heard this before, but I think it makes a really good point. It was Sunday morning in Duckland, and all the ducks dutifully came to church, waddling through the doors and down the aisle into their pews, where they comfortably squatted. When all were well settled and the hymns were sung, the duck minister waddled to his pulpit, opened the duck Bible and read, Ducks, you have wings, and with wings you can fly like eagles. You can soar into the sky, use your wings. It was a marvellous, elevating duck reading from the duck Bible. And thus all the ducks quacked their hearties, their ascent with a hearty amen. And then they plopped down from their pews and waddled home. Did we go away from last week's service longing for more of the Spirit in our lives, seeking the freshness and fire which only the Spirit can offer us? Did we spend time this week waiting on his presence and seeking more of his power in our lives? Or did we go away, and despite perhaps having the best intentions, forget all about it, like the ducks in this story? In Acts 2, 42, Luke describes how the early believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They didn't just do those things out of some sense of duty, or when they remembered to do so. They devoted themselves to them. These early believers were all in. This wasn't something they did half-heartedly or on the weekends they were free. They were absolutely devoted to it. Synonyms for devoted include committed, faithful, loyal, staunch, steady, constant, dedicated, unfaltering, unswerving, steadfast, unshakable, unwavering. I wonder how many of those adjectives we can apply to our own faith and to our own approach, our own attitude, to the Bible, to fellowship, to sharing communion together, to our prayer life and to our worship. We're going to look at some of these different aspects shortly. But I think the key thing here is that the believers in the early church devoted themselves to all these things because of the impact of the Holy Spirit on their lives. They weren't engaging with them because they felt they should and felt guilty if they didn't. They were engaging with them wholeheartedly because it was what they truly longed to do. As Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, puts it, 
When the Holy Spirit fills our lives, we begin to want what God wants and to see what God sees. In his grace, God interrupts our mundane little lives and calls us to follow. As we obey, our hearts are changed. The old covenant of selfish motivation is replaced with a new covenant written on our hearts and we now share God's priorities. The sacrifices of obedience are outweighed by the joy of being chosen to walk one step at a time in relationship with God. But the thing is, as we considered last week, the filling of the Holy Spirit isn't a one-off event. It's not something we receive once and can then forget about. We need to keep on being filled because as Phil said last week, we leak. And if we're not regularly refilled, our faith will end up stale, stagnant and dry. Like the dried up riverbed Andy shared a picture of last week, which needed fresh rain to refill and restore it. We need to keep on seeking God, keep on waiting on his presence and asking for more of him and his spirit and his power in our lives. Because we all need this, whether we've been Christians for five minutes or 50 years. This series has already reminded me just how much I need to keep on doing that, keep on waiting on God. As John Piper challenging us, challenges us, what we should seek is that God pour his spirit out upon us so completely that we're filled with joy, victorious over sin, and bold to witness. And the ways he brings that fullness are probably as varied as people are. However, it comes. Our first experience of the fullness of the Spirit is only the beginning of a lifelong battle to stay filled with the Spirit. It's a lifelong battle for each of us to stay filled with the Spirit, because we're not Jesus. We leak. Just imagine the impact the Spirit could make on our church and our community if we all collectively, actively, continually seek more of him in our lives and the life of our church, if we let go of our fears and the barriers we put up and open ourselves to more of his presence, more of his power. As we reflect on what a spiritual church looks like, what the marks of a truly spiritual church are, as described in Acts 2, let's consider how we as individuals and we as church might measure up. What are we doing well and what could we do better? How spirit-filled are we? So far in this series, Phil's sermons have focused on four Ps. Purpose, power, presence and place. And last week, three Fs. Filled, fresh and fire. So in keeping with that pattern, this week we'll be thinking about four Ws. Our first W is is word because the new believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It was, as John Stott said, a learning church. The new believers seemingly had an insatiable hunger for God's word. They were eager to study and learn from the apostles because the Spirit of God gives people a thirst for his word and leads them to want to act on it too. It's likely that the apostles' teaching would have included all Jesus himself taught and especially the good news of the gospel centred on his death, burial and resurrection, as Peter proclaimed in his speech recorded earlier in this chapter. Their teaching came from God and was closed with the authority Jesus had conferred on the apostles. So a spirit-filled church is deeply rooted in the word of God, is eager to learn from scripture and gives a high priority to sound teaching from it, and its focus is on Jesus. It seeks to keep the main thing the main thing, as we've said so many times before. A focus on the Holy Spirit does not need to be, indeed should not be at the expense of good theology, nor should we focus on scripture and neglect the Holy Spirit, because we need the Spirit to help us understand and interpret God's word and to keep pointing us to Jesus. How hungry are we for God's word? We're in an incredibly fortunate position in this country to have such easy access to the Bible in our own language, in multiple translations even, and the freedom to read it, discuss it and hear teaching from it without threat of persecution. Yet how often do we take this for granted and forget just how privileged we are compared to so many Christians elsewhere around the world? The Open Doors website, for example, recounts how 
when one believer in China received a Bible in his own language. His eyes brightened as if he'd spotted a treasure. He held it close to his chest and said, Thank you so much, brother. I've been dreaming about having a Bible for so long. Our second W is with. Because the new believers devoted themselves to fellowship, to koino koinonia, to life together. Or as the Passion Translation puts it, the hearts were mutually linked to one another. And in verse 44, Luke goes on to say, all the believers were together and had everything in common. There was a great sense of unity among these early believers. Their spirit-filled fellowship with Christ and with one another completely changed their priorities. It was, according to John Stott, a loving church. We had a learning church, a loving church. While I'm sure we all agree, meeting together and fellowship is really important. I imagine most of us would say we wouldn't want to meet together every day as these new believers did. Many of us sometimes struggle to meet even once a week on a Sunday. But I wonder if there might be scope for us to make meeting together a higher priority at times. If we really hungered after God and his word and fellowship with other Christians and were devoted to it in the way the new believers described in Acts 2 were, could we make it a higher priority in our lives? And then in verse 45 we're told, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. How do we square this way of living with our desire to store up possessions and invest for our future? Does this mean that every spiritual believer should sell everything they own and live in community with fellow Christians? There are some Christians today who do choose to do just that, such as those who are members of the radical Bruderhof community an evangelical Christian movement that bases much of what they do on the early church as described in the opening chapters of Acts, including asking all its members to sell pretty much everything they own and to commit to living with the community for the rest of their lives. There are, of course, other intentional Christian communities, such as Scargold or the Northumbria community, where people generally only commit to living as part of the community for a number of months or a couple of years rather than a lifetime, but they're still living as a community of believers. However, you'll probably be relieved to hear that most commentators don't think that we're called to sell all our possessions and live together in community today. Neither Jesus nor his apostles ever forbade private property ownership to all Christians. And even in the early church in Jerusalem, the sharing of property and possessions was voluntary. And it arose from the deep sense of fellowship which they all shared. And clearly many still had homes, as they broke bread in their homes as well as in the temple courts. But we are called to hold our possessions lightly and to be radically generous with what we have, especially towards the poor and needy. So we shouldn't seek to avoid the challenge posed by these verses altogether. Our third W is worship because the new believers devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were filled with awe and they were continually filled with praises to God. It was a worshipping church. These new believers didn't just enjoy spending time with one another. They worshipped together. They broke bread and prayed together. And they did this in both the formal setting of the temple courts and in the informal setting of their homes. It's likely that the breaking of bread referred to here is both the Lord's Supper as a reminder of Jesus' death and more generally sharing meals together in the way Jesus ate and drank with his disciples and shared fellowship with them. Remember when Jesus shared the Last Supper with his disciples, it was in the context of a meal, not part of a separate worship service at the temple. It's interesting to reflect that while we, as a church, consider that balance of formal and informal worship, we reflect that in our Sunday morning gatherings here at church and our connect groups which meet up in our homes during the week. I suspect most of us don't regularly meet up for shared meals. And even if we do do that, how often do we conclude communion as part of those shared meal times? 
Is that something we should try doing more of? The new believers also devoted themselves to prayer. As Phil reminded us a couple of weeks ago, if we want to experience the power of God at work in our lives, in the lives of those around us and in our community, we need to spend time in God's presence in prayer. We need to get down on our knees before him and acknowledge our total dependence on him. The Gospels record how Jesus often spent time in prayer, both alone and with his disciples. And the believers in the early church in Acts followed Jesus' example in this, devoting themselves to prayer. It wasn't just something they did when they had time to, or when they faced a moment of crisis. They devoted themselves to it because they realised just how important it was. Yet how easy do most of us find it to let prayer slip down our list of priorities? What things might we need to sacrifice in order to make more time to pray, to spend more time being in God's presence, waiting expectantly on him and his Holy Spirit? The other point to note about the believers' worship is that they were exuberant and joyful as they praised God, but they were also filled with awe with awe at the many wonders and signs done through the apostles. They recognised that a holy and powerful God was in their, midst, through the, in their midst through the apostles and responded with reverence, but also with great joy. How reverent and joyful is our worship. And our final W is witness, because the result of living a spirit-filled life and being devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer, was that they enjoyed the favour of all the people and were attractive to others. They were attractive to others and as such, as John Stott says, it was an evangelistic church. And so, as it says in verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The passage doesn't tell us that they were actively seeking to evangelise others though. They weren't knocking on doors or talking about to Jesus to those who didn't want to hear. But rather it seems that simply living spirit-filled lives, focused on Jesus and his teaching, meeting and sharing generously with one another in love, and spending time in prayer and worship, was enough to make them so attractive to others that more joined them daily. Their devoted lifestyle made them effective witnesses. And it was the Lord who added to the number. A reminder that all we can do is witness to others. We can't make people believe in Jesus. Only God can do that. So how effectively do our lives witness to others? Do our colleagues, friends and family know we're Christians? Can they tell we're Christians by the way we approach life? If they do, can they see it makes a positive impact on our lives? How attractive is our church to non-Christians? How will the way we welcome people to the house witness to others? Will the love and fellowship of Jesus be evident to all who walk through its doors? Now the observant among you will of course notice that these four W's are four of the five W's which we seek to base our connect groups on, which in turn are linked to our mission statement, to meet God through word and worship. To meet friends through fellowship with one another. And to make a difference by living lives which witness to others. One study describes this passage as a precious window into the world of the early church. And goes on to say, The ongoing result of the Holy Spirit's empowering with joy, miracles, boldness and fruitfulness and witness. Unity, sharing, care for the poor and worship. So to return to the question I asked earlier, how do you think our church compares? How would you describe our church? How might an outsider describe our church? Amen.